Well, I think it was a trick. Pastor beckoned me into his office. And I go in there and I look up and there's all this horrendous Dr. Pepper paraphernalia. And I, I don't know, I about had a heart attack, I guess. But all I know is that you're on my prayer list. You're right at the top, brothers. <laughs> No, I, I tell you what, I, I have thoroughly enjoyed my time uh, being with y'all and being a part of uh, your ministry, even uh, for just a, a little bit, and I'm so thankful uh, for these times, certainly count it as a, as a blessing and as a, as a privilege, something that I don't ever uh, take for granted or take lightly, and I trust um, uh, that even today, the Word of God has been of help to you and reminder to you. Tonight, I would encourage you to take your Bibles and turn to Revelation chapter 3. This is not exactly a passage that, um, you know, is an easy passage or a passage that uh, necessarily is a, is a comfortable passage. And I want to make some things clear here at the beginning uh, before we even get started because we are going to look at the church of Laodicea and understand something this... this uh, letter that was written to the church of Laodicea was written as a confrontation and as a condemnation, okay? Uh, there, was, there was no commendation for it. And so, understand something. I am not preaching this message in the same vein in which this letter was originally given. Why? Because I don't know your church, all right? I haven't sat down with your pastor and said, give me all the dirt, <laughs> okay? You know, tell me what I ought to preach, brother. Let me lay it on for you, okay? No, I've, I've not done any of that. I don't know where you are. I mean, I've, I've met some of you folks. I've had some good interaction with some of you. I um, feel like I've begun some, some new acquaintances and friendships. But look, I, I don't know the, the total direction of, of, of where you are personally or of, of where this church is going. So for me to just get up here and assume that if you are a church, you probably are Laodicean, that would be a very big mistake on my part, right? So this, church, this, this message is not given as a criticism of your church. Please understand that. Rather, this is a message that I have felt burdened to, to, to preach. In fact, I, I, I kind of you know, went over some other messages to kind of plead with the Lord if there might be something else that he'd rather have me preach, okay? Because I don't take this lightly here. This is very heavy stuff. Uh, in regards to what um, the Lord accosts these people about. And yet, this is what God's laid on my heart. And so I preach this not as a criticism, not as a condemnation, but rather as a warning to all of us. And I trust that you would, would be concerned enough about your church to take note of what is being said here and that you would evaluate and that if some of these things might, might be creeping up here and there, that you would counter that, that you would be willing to stand up for your church and that you would be willing to, to take action. Um, as well, what I would encourage you is to look at yourself individually because what is the church made up of? Individual believers, right? And isn't it interesting how... It starts very small. You know, one person can affect many. We know the story of Achan, right? And how his sin led to the loss of life. It led to great defeat. It led, led to despair of the people of Israel. And so we know that, that, that one person can have a great effect. And, and, you know, then you think about maybe two or three or four or five. It doesn't take very many with the attitude and with the mindset that was within this church to begin to wreak havoc and to really hurt the church. And so this is also a time for each one of us, myself included, to consider, are there things here that are written to Laodicea and to the church of Laodicea that are creeping up in my life that I need to more specifically, more personally attend to because I should not want, and I would hope that you as an individual who would be a member of this church, that you would not want to do that which would damage and hurt and detract from this ministry. So let's get right into this 
message here. Look at verse 18, or verse 14, sorry. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the, God, of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. I want you to understand something before we really dive into this. You know, Christ doesn't waste words. And Christ used some, some imagery here and some explanation here that the Laodiceans would understand very powerfully because Laodicea was located in the valley of Lycus or Lycus at an intersection of about three roads here. It was one of the richest com uh, richest commercial places at this time that this letter was written. It was noted for a few things. It's banking, okay? It's manufacture of clothing, especially a, a, um, a black wool that was highly sought after. And it also contained a highly recognized medical school. So this was a cutting edge city, all right? This was a, you know, this was a big deal place if you want to, to think of it that way. However, because of where it was located, its hot water came from a distance away. And when it would finally arrive, it was typically tepid or lukewarm in nature. In fact, above um, Laodicea was Hierapolis, and Hierapolis had or was noted for its hot springs. And then... Uh, a little south of, of, of Laodicea was Colossae. And guess what they had? Guess what they were known for in part? Cold water reserves. So you have these two, and sandwiched in the middle, if you want to look at it that way, is Laodicea. And the water that it received typically was lukewarm. So these people would immediately begin to understand the analogy that Christ was giving to them. So kind of an interesting beginning here. Notice the indictment that is given. There's an indictment about indifference that Christ makes. It highlighted, first of all, the church's complacent apathy. If you look back at verse 15, he says, I know your works that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. In other words, had, they had come to a place in their church ministry and life to where there really wasn't serious commitment. They had lost enthusiasm, zeal, urgency, passion, and compassion for the ministry and for the things of God. Though they weren't cold-hearted to the Word or to the work of God, there was no boiling fervency for the word and for the work of God. And folks, that is a most dangerous state. And people ask me a lot of times, how, what do you see across uh, the, the, the country and, and, and even you know, as you would travel occasionally uh, to foreign countries? Let me tell you something. I see this as a very prevalent problem in many, many, many churches. Many churches that were once on fire for God. They were fervent. They were passionate. They were committed. There was engagement. There was service. And now they have come to a state of complacent apathy. This is what this church was criticized for and what it was condemned for. A horrible indictment. Notice as well, though, that this letter also exposed the church's self-sufficient satisfaction as well as their ignorance. Look at verse 17. He says, Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. These people had become spiritually apathetic, and because of their apathy, they had also become self-sufficiently satisfied. I mean, they probably had, I mean, I'm just supposing, okay? But, you know, just kind of imagine with me, if you will. Maybe they had a really nice church building, right? I mean, come on, they were in a very influential place. There was a lot of wealth here. So it's, you know, it's very possible 
that they might have had a building uh, set aside for the worship similar to what we would have today. You know, maybe not these same dimensions or whatever. Who knows? But maybe they had a nice building. Maybe it was all, you know, quote, paid off. And, and maybe they, you know, who knows? Maybe they even had several programs that were running throughout the church. And, you know, all these things that were going on. And, and yet, God says, you have become self-satisfied. You think that you're doing great. You think that everything's okay because you've got your nice building. You, you're, you've got your, your building paid off. You have these programs. You know, everybody looks nice and whatnot, and yet you don't realize your true condition. He says, you think that you're rich, that you're wealthy, and yet you don't realize that you're wretched or that you are miserable or you are in a pitiable state. You think you're rich, but you are poor. They, were, they had become spiritually poor. And this is an allusion to, to a beggar. Think, of, think of, a, of, a, of a beggar, typically, right? No, no place to live, right? Poor clothing, lack of food, destitute, right? He says, you've become spiritually destitute. You think you've been increased with goods, so again, the idea here is that you'd, you'd, be, you'd be affluent and you'd be rich, and, and yet you're not. He says you are blind. You've lost your spiritual vision, your eternal perspective. You think you have need of nothing, and that, that is the idea of not needing even one thing. He says, and yet you don't even realize that you're naked. And nakedness carries the idea of a very carnal and shameful condition of a person here. It says, you are in a very pitiable state because you have become satisfied. You become self-sufficient. You're not relying upon me anymore. You're going through the motions. You're, you're playing religion, if it were. And folks, if there's one thing that I believe the Lord hates, and I, I tell you what, it is something that... that you know, I know that, that I despise and, and I hate it. To, I hate to see it in churches. I hate to see it in my life when I'm not right with God. And that is when we begin to become ritualistic and religious in our faith. Let me tell you something God has not saved you to be religious, God saved you so that you could have a meaningful, real, vibrant, vital relationship with Him. There's a complete difference between a Christian and a religious person. We ought to be living the difference. This church ought to be showing that difference consistently, vibrantly, full display. That can't happen when any church becomes self-satisfied and apathetic. This is the indictment that he gives. Notice, though, secondly, the impending response of God. Notice verse 16, if you would. He says, So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. In other words, Christ was inclined to reject this church, the church of Laodicea, he was inclined, he was preparing to reject her as one of his representative bodies. Now let me explain to you the graphic nature of this word, spew you out of my mouth. There is something that came along as a result of the curse. Obviously, there's a lot of things, right? But there is one particular thing, and it is called broccoli. <laughs> Amen. We are, okay, there's hope, brother. There's, there's hope here, okay? I, I cannot stand broccoli. I make no apology for it. It's a weed. It's a weed. Why would you allow it to grow in your garden? You pull weeds in your garden. You don't eat the weeds. We can argue about that later. Or you can just eat all of mine, okay? Because I am not going to eat it, no matter what. And if you're offended, too bad. <laughs> so we were at the Bill Rice Ranch. 
Aaron knows just a little bit about that. And we actually had a meal, Aaron, at the Rice's, uh, Bill and Mary Rice at their home. And why people do this to kids? Kids, listen, I'm on your side. You should not be forced to eat broccoli, okay? Yuck. Anyways, so, you know, anyways, Mary is a very mean person. Mary Rice, very mean. And so she made broccoli as a part of the meal. Well, my older brother, Brent, he kind of talked to mom to the side. He said, mom, please don't make me eat broccoli because I, I will get sick. I mean, just the smell of it made him nauseous. And so my kind-spirited, favoristic mom, biased, let him get away with not eating any broccoli. So I go up to her because, honestly, it, it, it was the same for me. And I, I told her, Mom, please, you know, please, don't, I don't want to eat broccoli. It'll make me sick. And she said, no, you're going to eat broccoli. Again, bias towards Brent, not her best son. <laughs> And so guess what? I had to eat the broccoli. It was so nasty. He said, well, if you put cheese on no, there is nothing that covers or wipes away, washes away the nastiness of broccoli, okay? Sin is sin. So really, folks. And so I eat this stuff, and it's so nasty, and it's horrible, and I kid you not, just a few minutes after, I proceeded to vomit all of that broccoli up. Number one, it served Miss Mary right. And secondly, <laughs> it resulted in my mom never making me eat broccoli again. Because <laughs> she realized I really couldn't handle broccoli. <laughs> like, I told you, Mom, you know? And literally, listen, when, when I vomited, it was a, let me, can, can I tell you something? It was a full, utter rejection. It all came out. You say, that is disgusting. You're right, it is completely disgusting. And that's exactly what Christ was saying to the Laodicean church. You have become so disgusting spiritually to me as one of my representative bodies that I am about to utterly reject you. Folks, what a condemning statement that Almighty God would say to his people. Not that he was talking about taking away their salvation, but literally the idea of ending their being a body, a church, that would be a testimony, a lighthouse, a representative for him. What a shameful thing that would be. What a horrific testimony that would be. But this is what the spiritual apathy and the spiritual self-satisfaction had led to. And so Christ was warning this church, you are making me sick to my stomach. And you're about to be utterly rejected. Notice something else, though, that I find interesting. Look at verse 19. He says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. So though he was inclined to reject Laodicea, he was, he was close. How close? I don't know how close, folks. But what I do know is this. It was coming, and yet he says, I yet love you. I always will love you. I'm giving you another opportunity. Repent. He was preparing to deliver some chastisement upon them. As you would see, he says, I rebuke and I chasten. He says, I'm about to deliver chastisement upon you because I love you, I care for you, I want you to change. Why? I want you to exist. I want you to, to still um, be a lighthouse and to be a testimony and be a work that, that points others to me. 
Just a wonderful example of the long-suffering, the patience, and the love of Christ. This is what the impending response of God was going to be. They had a choice. Folks, it was a very serious matter. And it should be considered by us as a very serious matter that God would set us to the side and be done. And let me tell you something. Let's remind ourselves individually and as a church, God doesn't have to use you. There's always another church. There's always another Christian. But you know what? God's desire is that all Christians and that all churches that would profess his name, that would believe on him, that would live by, and, and, and direct their ministries by his word would be used in great and multitude ways. And so therefore, he gives yet another chance, even if that means sometimes bringing upon them correction and chastisement. Why? To wake them up. To help them understand this is not the direction that you want to go. You need to have a change of heart, which leads us to the third and final point tonight. We've seen the indictment about the indifference. We've seen the impending response of God as a result of the indifference. But notice third and last of all, the instruction for the indifference. If you would, please look at verse 18. He says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with thy salve, that they mayest see. Several things here. He says, buy of me gold. The idea here is, when it says to buy, is the idea of investing, making an investment. And by the way, making an investment is, is usually requires some type of personal sacrifice and effort here. Again, this is not about working for your salvation, but rather this is the idea of you have grown apathetic. You have become spiritually lazy. You've become indifferent about your standing in Christ. You no longer look at me as supreme and you no longer desire to please me in all things. You need to get back on track. And that means making invest in, and, and buying of me gold. Invest, invest in that which is, is valuable from God. How does that happen? Well, pursue the things of God. Pursue once again living for God. Pursue the word of God. Because the word of God, the Bible tells us in Colossians, in whom are it all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Christ who is word, he, he gives us all that pertains to life and godliness. So we are to invest in that. We're to invest in the word. We're to live for God, live and serve him. Yes, it takes some sacrifice. Yes, it requires effort. That is why God tells us in, in Philippians 2 that we are to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Listen, God is not going to live the Christian life for you. God is going to enable you. God is going to guide you. God is going to direct you. God is going to provide whatever you need, particularly through his word, but as well as through people and circumstances and other things that sometimes we don't even necessarily fully realize as you would be willing to engage your life. But listen, Again, as we were talking about this morning, you are responsible personally for pursuing and living a life of godliness. He says, buy of me gold. He's saying here, allow my rebuke to re-impassion you and constitute a change. A change to where you don't see yourself as rich, but as destitute. That, you're, that your wealth is not in your position as far as what you have in a physical sense or the numbers that you have in your church or, or your bank account as a ministry or how many missionaries you support or even how many programs, but, but rather how you are living for me and how you're being true to my word and how you are living in a proper way, living as, as Paul puts it in Romans 12, fervently serving the Lord. He says as well, to buy of white raiment. The idea here of, of white is, is of purity. It would seem to speak of the clothing of righteousness or living in, in righteous conduct. We are told in Colossians chapter 3 that we are to 
put off and that we are to put on certain things. And, and literally, we're not, we're not going to go into full detail in that passage, but the idea of, of the word or of the phrase put on is to adorn yourself with a representative dress. Okay? In other words, folks, as a Christian, I am to live in a way that reflects my relationship with Christ. And when you are living in a spiritually apathetic, self-satisfied manner, what you are showing is that you are living for yourself. You are going back to the attire of worldliness and living as if there's not a relationship with God. Why would you want to dress in that? That clothing is defiled. That clothing is corrupt. That clothing was affecting you in a negative manner. Have you ever... Have you ever been working and your clothes have gotten, you know, you've gotten hot and sweaty and you've been working and they get filthy and dirty and, and you know, eventually you, you go in and, and, you know, and your kids or your wife or whoever says, man, you stink. Now, just the other night, now this is kind of, I, mean, I kind of like this smell, but it's still, it's a permeating smell. I was, um, I, I love to smoke, not this, okay, don't, don't get too excited. <laughs> Okay, I like to smoke meat. Remember, I'm a hunter, meat eater here. Okay, and so, so I smoked some baby back ribs the other night. Smoked it with pecan wood, and man, just the meat came clean off the bone, juicy, tender. Am I making you hungry yet? Okay, and but you know what? Let me tell you something. That smoke coming out, it it just permeates the clothing right? It really does. And you know, you, you smell it. And I even smelled it in my hair for like a day, you know? It just, it permeates, right? What's permeating your life to the good or to the bad? What is reflecting the influence of your life? We are to live righteously. We are to adorn ourselves with with righteousness, living God's way, living in obedience to God's word, to God's principles, but notice that he also says that we are to anoint thine eyes with eye salve. In other words, we, we, are to, we are to allow God to restore our spiritual vision. I believe that, again, this comes through the, the studying, the reading, the meditating of God's word. I believe that it can also come about as we would re-engage our lives of prayer. I think for a lot of Christians, myself included, part of our apathy and self-satisfaction comes when we, begin, we, when we begin to neglect these two foundational aspects of Christian living. We relegate them as, as almost like kid-like things, but they are not kid things. These are absolutely vital aspects of the Christian life. And if you are not in God's word, and if you are not in prayer, guess what? You are not maintaining and sustaining a vital relationship with the Lord. And if that's not being maintained, guess what's going to happen? Self-satisfaction and apathy. And sometimes we need to be reminded of that so that we would that we would realize that we, we, are, we are acting as if we are, are blind. In fact, we are encouraged in 2 Peter that we are to be adding to our faith. And he confronts, Peter confronts him, he says, he says uh, you are blind and cannot see afar off. The thing, he says, the one that lacketh these things, in other words, the person that's not engaging in these areas of spiritual addition, if you were, are, is spiritually blind. Literally, the idea is that you are willingly blinding yourself to these things that need to be a part of your Christian living. We need some eye salve so that our proper spiritual vision can be restored so that we might be a vibrant people for Christ. So the instruction, first of all, allow the rebuke to, to re-impassion and constitute a permanent change. But secondly, notice that it's also encouraged, the church here is to encourage to resume an active, continual fellowship. Look at verse 20, if you would. Verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him, and he with me. This is a church, this is a verse that has unfortunately been taken out of context as a means of, 
of salvation. That Christ is knocking on the, on the heart's door and that, you know, if you just open your heart and Christ, let Christ come in, he will save you. That's, that's not the proper context here. This is speaking of the fellowship of Christ with the believer and with the church. These people were neglecting this. These people were just going through the rudimentary ritualistic actions of worship, but it wasn't meaningful. It wasn't real. True fellowship with Christ wasn't taking place. And a couple of things reflect Christ's desire here. He says, I stand at the door and knock. This is a continual action. He was desirous of the fellowship. Folks, listen, Christ, God is always desirous of fellowship with us. He loves us. He cares for us. He's provided us the gift of salvation. God's not going to turn his back on us. He desires that ongoing fellowship. And so he knocks. He continued to knock. And then he says, if, you, if I knock and if any man hear my voice, and that is the idea of him seeking to make himself known. Have you ever gone up to a house and you knock on the door and say, hello, you know, hey, I'm here. Okay, especially to someone that you know. Maybe you've done something like that before. That's exactly the picture here. He's making himself known so that there would be a response of, of, of proper fellowship enjoined, if that makes sense. Christ desired active, continual fellowship with this ministry. He didn't want to shut them down. He did not want to reject this representative body. He, he would take no pleasure in that. What he would take pleasure in them is them heeding his indictment, them responding to his correction, and to, to them changing and resuming a, an active, continual fellowship. Now, as we close tonight, a couple of thoughts. Where do you find yourself? You know, I would hope and, and pray and trust that this is not an across-the-board situation of this church, that this would not be a mark of this church. And from what I've seen in the brief time that I've been here, it, it, it doesn't appear like this would be a, a widespread thing here, that this would be something that would define your church. Again, I've only been here a, you know, a day and a half, really. A couple days, right? But maybe there are some areas in which you can look and you can see that maybe there is some Laodicean attitude. Well, are you willing to, in a proper spirit and attitude and heart, talk to Pastor Henry about that? Maybe express your concerns in a, in a humble and in a, in a proper fashion that's desirous of, of things being addressed and maybe taken care of and changed? Or what about you personally, though? Have you found that you personally, and this is where it begins, folks, Something that becomes widespread and identifies as a whole starts very small. So maybe you can look at yourself and, and tonight maybe see that maybe you have become self-satisfied and spiritually apathetic in an area or maybe a couple of areas, maybe multiple areas. I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not the Holy Spirit. I, I don't know what's going on in your life. But maybe that's taking place. And maybe on the outward, everything looks good to some extent. But in the, if you were to be honest before God, you would have to say, you know what? I am becoming, or I already am, very Laodicean in my life. Would you recognize that you are in a very dangerous position tonight? Would you recognize that if you allow this continue, that your life can literally have a devastating effect on others and even upon the whole of this church body? 
I would trust that you would not desire that. I would trust that you would love your Lord and that you would love your church enough that you wouldn't want that to take place. That you would want to guard against that. That you would want to fight against that. Because this should mean something. This body, these people, your Savior should mean enough to you to watch out for that and fight against that. I don't know how God has used this message tonight. All I know is that he has burned my heart to share it with you. There is much more that we can say, but I hope that what I have shared from this passage has been clear and that we would remind ourselves, if nothing else, if nothing else, if everything is right, if everything is, is, is good in your life, if, if, if this church is, is on course and vibrant, at the very minimum, May this message tonight serve as a reminder that if we don't pay attention to this, if we aren't on guard about this, that we can go, you can go, this church can go in the same exact direction as this church of Laodicea. And it doesn't necessarily take that long. Let's bow our heads and pray.